Nowhere is a place on the internet where you can find entertainment like everywhere else, I was told. It is really easy to find if you have been told about it. Now you are being told about it. I would advise you don't get curious. I was curious when I was told about it, even though I was warned. It is not as confusing as it looks. This is a straightforward story of nowhere on the internet and how not to find it. I had an eerie feeling when I logged into my computer that evening, facing an atmospheric teal page with directions on how to access nowhere. Carlos had told me about it and his testimony had been simple. He had gotten nowhere from some other friend of his who had gotten into it from some game. It was all a mess when Carlos tried to explain after a couple bottles of liquor. He was reticent sober anyway, so you never really got much off of him. The promise was a simple bet between the host of nowhere and the participant. The game was determined by the host, but it was always simple, Carlos had explained to me. If the visitor to nowhere wins the game, they would get cash, lots of cash. Carlos said that he had heard of it. They would have delivered it to you after the game. There was a tempting prospect to it. Everything was possible on the dark web if you look hard enough. Yet, it was there on the front page of the screen, a flickering icon on the topmost right corner of my screen, the promise of more money than I could imagine. If anyone had won that much money, how is it possible no one has ever heard of it? I wondered to myself as I blankly watched the screen load. I shrugged my shoulders and dismissed the thought when it occurred to me that it was on the dark web and word almost never got out of such things. Well, here we go, I said in a muffled breath as I leaned closer to my computer. I rubbed my hands together and felt it clammy, so I wiped it all the way back to clear the nervous perspiration. When I was done, I slowly ran my fingers over my keypad and typed in the instructions into the column that was specified for it. Easy. Please wait as we redirect you to nowhere. Those were the words that reeled over my page as I waited. I wasn't always given to imagination, but on that occasion, I had cause to. If I had ever gotten a whole box of cash with that much value at no extra cost to me, what would I do with it? I paused and thought. The question lingered in my head as I toyed with my keypad. It was a mess. Stupid. I scoffed as I read through the directions and my screen suddenly went blank. Then, it came on in a flood of lights. Hello? A tiny voice echoed from the other end of the speaker. Hey there, I whimpered, uncertain as to my own expectations even as I awaited the game. I assessed the canvas on my screen, the silhouette of a smallish figure, albeit human. The background itself was gray, a crude shade that appeared grainy on my screen. I clutched my fingers together and cleared my throat. How did you find nowhere? The voice came again, this time with the freakish outline of what I assume was the face. I blanched at the first horrible features. Then I smiled, assuming it to be some terrible prank on me. The man's face was tan so much that he appeared brown that he did white, which I could see from the undersides of his wrinkled cheeks. He had a horrible droop on both sides of his face, heavy and forlorn. Even the skin of his forehead drooped, hanging over each of his eyes like saggy sachets. On each of his brows to hold up the sagging skin was a thicket forest of brows. He smiled. I shrugged. It had to be a mask. I thought to myself. There was nothing in this world so hollow as the man's eyes as I felt my stomach tighten of their own natural accord as I pressed my attention firmly to the screen before me. He was horribly ugly, but it was not his ugliness which made him so unsettling as much as his demeanor. I detached from the aura which poured in surplus from the screen and found myself struggle to push breath down my chest. Um, I tried to clear my head, 
conjuring an answer for him. A friend mentioned. The last player? He quizzed. The last player? I retorted, scowling as I tried to recall if Carlos had told me he had played himself. I had not heard from him in days. There can only be one player per recommendation, you see. The host revealed. I nodded. He smiled whirly. It was nothing like the first time when he did smile. There was a shallowness that betrayed his position. Still, I was glued to the screen. You wish to play a game at nowhere, don't you? He said. Sure. Meet me at these coordinates in three hours, the host of nowhere said and immediately dropped off a location as my screen suddenly went blank. I sighed. It would be easy money as I swept myself to my feet and plugged my earphones into my ears to meet with the host of nowhere. This morning, I woke up in a blood-stained shirt. The first time was three days ago when I arrived at nowhere and I was seized. The first morning was the worst. I had a horrible dream. Before my dream, I had had a horrible day. I had to kill a man to live. I have since killed three. My stomach held in the air of its own accord too feebly, and I retched instinctively. Nowhere had promised me a simple game, and they had lied. I was captive in the twisted course of gains that Carlos never told me about. Fucking moron, the man who wrestled beside me said. He was tall and dark. I did not look at him in the face. I was weary of it. It was too much familiarity for a man that I was supposed to kill. He seemed to take it in his stride, and I did not feel the tragedy in his voice when he neared me. It was all entertainment for nowhere and those who financed it. I was a character in a game with other humans whose lives were disposable like characters in a video game. It was a misery I could not bear to live for too long. I placed my hands under my pillow and withdrew the knife when he was close to me. I turned the knife backwards and slashed uh. where I sensed his neck was. Uh. He grunted and fell on me. The host of nowhere chuckled through the speakers maniacally. That was beautiful. Now, get off your bed. You have won the prize money. My name is Maria, and I'm 27 years old. I'm originally from Brazil, but I came to the United States to work as a model. Soon enough, I became a small celebrity in the business. I appeared on some magazines, was featured in videos, and my online popularity was increasing. My pages on social media like Instagram and of course my YouTube channel were getting more and more attention. Then I found out about OnlyFans. I created my page and things started to head north financially. I ended up developing an interesting and healthy relationship with a young man named Jason. He was 24 years old and being a talented computer programmer, despite his age, had already established a solid and successful career. He was also good looking and I was getting genuine pleasure from our conversations. Models also have feelings of course. So, after one year of online chatting, he finally decided to invite me on a date, and I accepted. I already had several other faithful followers whose money was equally as good, so I took the risk. When you mix business with pleasure, chances are the first one is probably going to end. We went out for dinner, a nice Vietnamese restaurant, and I had a great time. Jason seemed genuinely interested in what I had to say. I'm far from being a shallow and ignorant person. We shared our ideas about the world, our taste in music and literature. I'm very happy that you accepted my invitation. So, do you think it was worth it to meet your biggest fan? Jason asked me with a smile as we left the restaurant. <laughs> yes, I would say so. 
and believe if you want, but you are the first fan and follower that I ever met on a personal level. I guess my sixth sense told me to go for it. Life is short, as they say, and sometimes you have to take chances. Professional success isn't everything, and you probably know it yourself. Let me ask you something more personal. Don't you ever meet girls in real life? Oh, I do. Or I used to. But none of them really took my mind away from my computers, so to speak. I think I had more fun playing video games. Some of them designed by me. But it's not the same with you, Maria. With you, it's different. Actually, I think I'm feeling something real, rather than a casual game. I hope we can go out again, Jason replied. I would like that. Goodbye, Jason. And thank you for a wonderful evening. I said as we departed with a hug before heading to our respective cars. As weeks passed by, Jason and I kept meeting at each other's places and events. We went to the movies, to a rock concert, planned a visit to a natural park, and Jason even took me to his workplace. A big building filled with cabins of computers, of course. He introduced me to some of his friends and colleagues, and I liked them. Very down-to-earth and pleasant people, including a chubby goth girl, all tattooed, dressed in black, obviously, and with short purple hair. Maria, meet Jessica, a true genius, addicted to cheeseburgers and programming as well, Jason said. Eventually, and with no surprises, Jason became my boyfriend. He took me to his house, which was a huge mansion in an exclusive neighborhood, the house was part of a big property in which there was a swimming pool and even a tennis court. Inside, things were no less impressive. The gaming room was Jason's favorite place, but it wasn't just for video games. There was a roulette, a slot machine, a real pinball machine, a pool table, and even a giant chess game. Jason lived alone, but he had hired a staff that worked on his house from the early morning to 9 p.m. <laughs> I don't know what to say, Jason. I must warn you, my place isn't as spectacular as yours, I said. Oh, I bet I'm going to love it, Jason answered. I can only hope. You'll get to know more about me, because I decorated it myself. It's a small but cozy apartment, though, in a decent building. Looks don't pay as much as brains, I answered, and we both laughed. I couldn't be happier. I promised Jason that I would cook dinner for him at my place. He was going to spend the whole weekend with me there. Maria, I was right. I do love your place. It's nice and cozy. What are these artifacts that you use as decorations? They're so exotic. It's African art. I'm glad you like them. And the paintings as well? Wonderful landscapes. Who made them? Actually, I did. I replied, blushing. You didn't mention that you painted. You're full of surprises, Maria. I wanted to hear your opinion. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. After eating dinner, in which I served a simple Brazilian dish composed of black beans, meat, and broccoli, we watched a couple of movies on the couch, and then we went to bed. The next morning, Jason woke me up. He had a strange look on his face. He appeared to be scared and confused. Maria, what is this? I found these old pictures and also an ID card in your drawer. It's you. I can tell. But at the same time, it's not you. Oh my God. Why didn't you tell me, Maria? Or should I call you Mario? I felt my heart racing as I heard the words that Jason said. He found out my secret. I was born a male, but I went through the necessary and complicated procedures in order to change my gender. Jason, you're an intelligent and open-minded man. For sure you understand. I always felt like a girl, a woman, and I became one when I was 20. Please accept it. Accept me, I said to Jason, getting off the bed trying to hug him. His reaction was hostile. Don't touch me, freak. I'm disgusted. You disgust me. 
I disgust myself. I can't believe I had sex with you. I thought I loved you. I'm getting out of here. Wait until everyone knows about this, Jason shouted. My survival instinct kicked in. I couldn't let anyone find out the truth of my past, both for personal and professional reasons. My life would be ruined. Fortunately, I grew up in a tough neighborhood in Brazil, and I knew how to defend myself and how to attack. Some habits die hard, and my reptilian brain always tells me that I should be prepared, even when I trust people that I invite into my home. When Jason turned his back on me, he made a basic street mistake. Apparently, Jason didn't search for the drawer in which I had a loaded gun in my bedroom. In just a few seconds, I grabbed the gun, covered it with my pillow using it as a silencer, and shot Jason in his back. He fell on his stomach. I went to him and held his head so he could face me during the last moment. I'm sorry, Jason. I wish you had made a different choice. I guess you weren't who I thought you were either. I said to him as I kissed his lips right before death took him away. It was a this story is inspired from a Russian guy who, in his 20s, did something stupid, which later on turned out to be the worst decision of his life. The guy, in order to look big, not only went under the knife, but got petroleum jelly injected into his body. Before his muscles started to sag, he did become famous as the Russian Popeye. For years, my friend Andre had dominated the light while I lurked in the shadows. He was one of those fortunate mesomorphs with just the right anatomy for a bodybuilder's physique. I, on the other hand, was an ectomorph, thin as a fishbone and hopeless around weights. While he either wore tight tank tops or shirts, which he took off at the slightest excuse, I wore baggy shorts and avoided every reason to get bare-bodied around other people. This was until I decided to hit the gym. Unfortunately, a month's worth of grueling hard work failed to bring me the changes I desired. So I gave up. Maybe God made me this way. Maybe I was too puny, being a challenge to his will. Maybe I should just accept my body as it was. But the mind is a devil, isn't it? It doesn't accept things easily especially when your friend is living his best life with the best quality women. Seeing Andre with a new girl almost every other week made me jealous. It burned my heart, and the desire to have huge muscles of my own grew stronger every time I saw him having a good time. You just don't have the body, he said. You have to pump your muscles artificially. That's the only way. You mean by pills and powder? I asked him. Your body is too weak to accept all those roids. You won't be able to handle the side effects. Then what do I do? Eh, there was an easier and faster way. Plastic surgery. It's expensive, but if you knew how, you could do it locally at very little cost. How do I do it? I know a guy, Andre said, and gave me a phone number. He helps skinny guys like you get buffed up. I was certain I wanted it, so I made the call and met up with this contact. His contact was named Soul, and he seemed to be good at what he did. As a matter of fact, he had a number of guys with great testimonials for his services. So I subjected myself to his needles and scalpels and got injected with just the right amount of petroleum jelly. Just the right amount were his favorite words. You need just the right amount, he'd say. It can't be too big, it can't be too small. Just the right amount for your body size. The girls will go bonkers. And they did go bonkers. I had just the right amount of augmentation. My biceps and triceps were now the huge sort that they'd love to hang on to. My chest the hard padded sort they'd love to lay their heads on. It was then that I began to enjoy a bit of what Andre was used to. 
My before and after pictures on Instagram blew up my following. Of course, I didn't tell anyone what I had done. It was a better story if I had grown the muscles through hard work at the gym. Everybody loved those who did the impossible. And to make my story more realistic, I did join the gym. I used to click a lot of pictures and post them on Instagram. It was there that I saw her. Her name was Trisha. Post my plastic surgery, I had dated several girls, but Trisha was something else. She was a perfect 10. I hadn't seen such a girl in my life. I knew I had to get her, but there was a problem. There were numerous guys like me in the gym. I had to stand out from them in order to impress her. Once again, I spoke with Andre and asked him what to do. He patted me on the back and told me I was on the right path. Men like us were not meant for mediocrity. We would do anything to get whatever and whoever we wanted in life. We are the highest breeds of animals. Call up soul, you dog, Andre roared. With Andre's words and a strong desire to get Trisha, I booked another appointment with Soul. I will do what you want, but there can be consequences. Remember, it has to be just the right amount. It is the things that we want more than anything else that kill us in the end. Sometimes we know this, other times we don't, yet we still go for it. To hell with consequences, I can't stop Soul. I am a true animal. Bowing to my constant demand and double the payment, so agreed to the surgery. He injected me with more jelly and let his knife and scalpel do wonders on my body. What I had always wanted was displayed before me right now in its full glory, a perfectly sculpted body, abs that looked like they had been chiseled out of a rock, biceps that rippled with hard muscles and thighs that made me think of a smooth rock. I could easily give Mr. America a run for his money. My good time, though, was short-lived. It started to die when the pain began and the muscles started to lose their cohesion. My biceps, which were once a source of pride, suddenly became awkward chunks of thick, viscous fluid hanging from my arms under my flesh. People noticed, and the admiration faded away. In its place, contempt and mockery grew. I stopped going out and started to hide out in the apartment. Still, the disdain of my friends followed me in. They reveled me constantly on my social media pages until I logged out of my apps and began to plan my suicide. One day, Andre came over to stay for the weekend. He still had all of it, and he still didn't mind showing it off before me. There was a smirk on his face now as he posed. Come on, man. Shit happens. Such is life. I know you will be back soon. Kill him. I flinched. The voice in my head had always had the effect on me. It was the pain or the fever. It had to be. Kill him. I'm going for a run, Andre said. Will you be okay? He asked me. As if you care. I nodded. I was not going to be okay. My petroleum jelly muscles were hanging from my arms, a mass of uselessness that had brought me ignominy and suffering. My chest sagged like a 200-year-old woman with double Ds. They were eating up my body from the inside, burning me up with a persistent fever. Be back in an hour, Andre said, and left the apartment. I laid there on the sofa. He was no longer here, and that made me even more angry than I had ever been. He could go out to anywhere. He wanted to live life the way he wanted. I, on the other hand, was destined for horrified stares and derision. It's all his fault. His fault. His fault. I jumped. The voices were getting louder inside my head. They're just voices, I told myself. Nothing more. 
Still, they were right. Andre was the reason I had done what I had done. The voices in my head drove me to the internet, and I opened up a site on the dark web where I opened a specific type of poison. They promised 30 minutes delivery. Soon, the bottle of poison was in my room. Kill him, kill him, kill him. Stop, I yelled and shivered. Kill him. These days, it was getting harder and harder to convince myself that they weren't part of an hallucination. I was running a temperature and spending my days in pain. Pain which was becoming impervious to the painkiller drugs. Kill him. I rose from the sofa and walked shakily into my room. The poison was a colorless liquid in a transparent bottle with no label. I had been assured that it was tasteless and would guarantee a quick and painless death. The sound of the front door getting unlocked floated to my ears. Peals of laughter followed it. It was Andre. He had returned from his run and probably brought back a conquest, someone for whom I must scurry away and hide out in my room, lest I be regarded with horror and disdain. I think this is what made me snap. I stumbled down the hallway past them. Andre said something and the girl laughed again. Before they entered the bathroom, I managed to catch sight of the girl and it was then that all hell broke loose. I lost all my control, and the voices in my head went mad. The girl was Trisha. Quickly, I rushed to the kitchen, opened the refrigerator, and grabbed his smoothie. It was the first thing he drank whenever he returned back from workouts. It was supposed to help him with muscle gain. Now, it would bring his end. I uncapped the bottle and poured the poison into it. Then, I sat there on the couch. Seeing my body, Trisha started to laugh, but it didn't bother me. I watched as she laughed and shared a smoothie with Andre. <laughs> as she saw me laughing back at her, Trisha stopped her laughter. Perhaps she realized she was wrong, but it was too late for her. Soon, they both started vomiting and held onto the stomach with pain. Peace returned to me, but it returned with darkness of oblivion. I went back to my bedroom. Once I was in, I locked the door and fell onto my bed. There, I surrendered my consciousness to sleep and a fevered dream. Hi, my name is Luke. Well, actually, it isn't. But when time comes to exercise some demons and share a few episodes, anonymity is necessary. And speaking of time, I was almost 45 when I lost my job at the university. I was a teacher there for 20 years when they finally decided to let me go. This only contributed to the implosion of my marriage which wasn't already experiencing a healthy and happy period. Me and my wife simply realized that we couldn't stand each other anymore, so I left our home. We have one daughter in her early 20s, but she's a complete disgrace. Her lifestyle is a complete mess. Half of the time, she doesn't even live in our house, at least when I was still around. She had some more boyfriends that I could remember, and given some medication that I saw, I'm pretty sure she has being a beautiful girl, it's always been easy for her to find someone to give her money. Apparently, it came with a price. In any case, I wasn't exactly sad when I left those two women behind me. My ex-wife and only daughter, who I barely knew and definitely had no intention of knowing any better. Still, I had to find a new place for me to live and also a new job. Fortunately, I had a generous amount of savings, which allowed me to rent a decent apartment. As for the job, well, I decided to try a new life as an Uber driver. And of course, I had the career and previous experience to find something with a better paycheck, but my mind was already drifting, and I was feeling restless and depressed. So this felt like an adventure, going to different places, meeting new people, 
even for a short and casual talk. Plus, I always loved to drive. The first couple of weeks were a little bit stressful, but at the same time, I was enjoying it. There was a feeling of adrenaline that I liked. I was already dealing with all sorts of clients, driving them to distinct destinations. Most of these individuals were relatively boring, others drunk, sketchy, or annoying, but a few of them also very interesting. I particularly enjoyed the beautiful women, of course, specifically when they were alone or at least with other female friends. Nevertheless, after a month of being an Uber driver, something happened, and it wasn't exactly glamorous. On one occasion, I drove a client to a bad neighborhood. A young man, probably no older than 20 years old, appeared to be nervous. He was shaking and sweating from head to toe. He had long blonde hair which covered his face. Hey, uh, buddy, are you all right? I asked, more concerned about knowing if he had money to pay for the ride, and also by making conversation. I thought I could prevent him from throwing up in the car. Uh, yeah, man, uh, it's good. I'm, uh, just a little sick. Don't worry, I can pay for this. It's all good. He replied, as if reading my thoughts. I assumed that he was just in need of his daily dose of some kind of drug, Eventually, I arrived to his destination, an old house on a dark street. The young man was faithful to his word and paid me. As I was driving back, I saw someone lying on the sidewalk in one of those creepy and a half-abandoned dark streets that were part of the neighborhood. It appeared to be a woman. Feeling in a good mood because I had received money from my client, I decided to check to see if the woman needed any help. I stopped and got out of my car and approached the woman, not even knowing whether she was dead or alive. Now, I think my subconscious just made a connection to my rebellious daughter, how she could, one day, sooner or later, be in the same situation. Um, hello? Do you need any help? It's dangerous to be here lying on the street like this, I said, getting closer. I couldn't see her move at all so I touched her to see if she was actually breathing. Then, finally, I got a response. Hey, get away from me, you creep. It's a free country. It was indeed a young woman, although she didn't look so young. Very thin, dark and dead eyes, just like her hair. My name is Luke. Let me help you. This is no life. How old are you? Let me call your family. I said, not really measuring my words, but I felt good saying them. I'm old enough to be your daughter, you sick dude. I'm off duty tonight. No party. Take your money and your sick fantasies somewhere else. I really want to help. Please, I can take you somewhere. A shelter. My name is Luke. What's your name? I have a daughter your age, I insisted. Yeah. I heard you the first time, Luke. I'm a I don't have a name, and I'm not deaf. Good for you and your daughter. Now, unless you want to help me by giving me some serious money, get lost, the woman replied. Suddenly, I felt an urge, like an epiphany. Thoughts were being whispered into my mind. She's lost. There's no way back for her. There's only one option, to end her pain to put her out of her misery. The poor child. Hey, why are you looking at me like that? Why are you crying? You're insane, dude, back off! The woman shouted as I, with tears of sadness in my eyes, grabbed her by the throat with one hand and the other covered the woman's mouth and nose. I saw her surprised eyes, confused as I suffocated her to death. It was quick easy and painless. I felt relieved and I believed in her own way. She did too. I hid the body behind some bushes nearby. It was only for a couple hours. My shift was over and after returning to the Uber, I was going to get to my own car to pick up the girl's body. This was done in less than a couple hours while it was still dark so no one saw us and even if they did, who would care? No one would, except for me. I covered the girl with a big blanket and took her to my apartment. 
The building where I live has its own garage, so I managed to transport her from the garage to my apartment without anyone noticing through the stairs. It was the middle of the night. In the university, I was, among other related disciplines, a teacher of legal medicine, so I knew how to dissect and embalm a body properly, which is what I did within the next few days. I removed the organs that would rot easily, but I kept the eyes, the skin, the bones, and the hair. Treating them with the appropriate substances, I did a good job. She really looked alive, a lot more than she was before I killed her. I even noticed that the one woman had an ID card with her. Her name was Irina. She is now safe with me in my home, in a secret cold room that I built for her. Safe and in peace. Forever. I bopped my head slowly to the music that blasted through the radio as I took a dedicated puff of the cigarette I had in my left hand. She approached the car with a swagger that made my heart skip. It had been 12 years since I had last seen her, my first love. It was her who had done it to me for the first time, and if I were to believe the words she said when she still loved me, it was I who had done it to her for the first time. I saw her smile into the phone which she was craned into, and I shut my eyes. It broke my simple heart to see her laugh so calmly. I had endured thirteen years of her torture. Twelve of these years you count. I had been away. And for what? I opened my eyes and took another pull off of the stub of my cigarette. The embers came alive and the tobacco caught on with a strong crackle. I felt the heat run into my head and my mouth pooled with spittle. She stopped and looked around. Then she held the phone to her face and spoke into it. I reclined in my seat and looked away. I could barely bring myself to watch her talk like that into the phone when I knew it was a lover she spoke to. Fuck, I growled, biting my lower lip with frustration and balling up my fist into a strong clasp. When I returned my gaze to her, I observed just how much time had passed between us. She was now older than I remembered her to be, but no less beautiful and no less capable of making my heart stop. Her lips were dark shade of maroon. Even though I remembered them being paler in our younger years, I sighed. I would never have to remember her again at the end of the day. I would never lose her again. I loved her too much to lose her over again, even though she had hurt me. She moved over to the curb and touched the tip of her shoes over the stony floor. I could sense the fever of her conversation had consumed her, and she had no idea of her environment. I unclasped my hand and sighed when it no longer hurt. The object in my clenched fist no longer bore into the tender patch of my palm. She was always so vulnerable. The need surged in my chest, just as I had set out to do. The urgency to protect her from the world, to keep her away from all that could harm her. I desired to keep her for myself. I could protect her. I flushed with a warm sensation and held my hand to the car door and pushed it ajar just as she stepped closer. Hey, I said when I was fully out of the car. The rancid smell of tobacco evaporated in haste. The soft smell of her skin, the richness of her musk replaced the atmosphere around my nostrils and my desires grew stiffer. The rush in my veins turned warmer. My fingers twitched with impatience and I wished I still had a cigarette. Hey, she said back. With a passive stare, she moved past me. Elizabeth, I called, more certain than I wasn't. She swirled, lingering gaze boring passion from all those years ago back into my soul. The evening had a higher meaning. The romance of her eyes, 
hazel heat that made me weak at the knees. She had more hair than I recalled, and they sat so beautifully on her shoulders like the perfect models on magazine covers. Excuse me? She arched her brows in question. Elizabeth, I iterated, shaky from a rush of thoughts that ran my head to tiredness. Give me a moment, Mark. She spoke into the phone, and my heart snagged in my chest. Do, do I know you from somewhere? My lips hung loose when I desired to speak. It was a bad time to reminisce, but I could not help myself as I stumbled back to our first meeting and her effervescence. She still retained the spark, although I could tell time had left its mark on her as it had on me. She had started to wrinkle just above her lips, which was now fuller. My heart ached for her, and I designed to stop it. Look, Elizabeth, I still have it, I said, rolling the small pendant in my hands up to her face. She flinched at first and stared at me askance. She ought to have remembered it. It was a gift she had handed to me on the first night we had done it. I had kept it with me all those times, even when I had been sent away. She did and was immediately white with horror. I smiled. I knew why. Richard? She said and stumbled backwards away from me. I have a restraining order against you. Stay away from me. I have stayed away for too long now, haven't I? My eyes darted across the street, and I noticed it was a short run before I caught up to her anyway. You killed both my parents, and you got sent away for murder, Richard. You're the devil. She sobbed, and it broke my heart. I want nothing to do with you. My ears whirled. The smile washed off my face at the words that struck me so stiffly and made me sick instantly. I had killed her parents because they'd gotten our way. Now... She was doing the same. I could not stand it. Don't hurt me, Elizabeth. I've carried your cross for twelve years. I got off for good behavior because I want to spend the rest of my life with you, I said as I moved closer. I don't, Richard. You're evil, and you should rot in hell, she said. I had had enough. She bolted, but I was quicker. But she fell over, over the hard tar floor with her face first. I rushed over and climbed astride her back. Blind with rage, as I was all those thirteen years ago, when I had first arrested her for her sake. I held her head and smashed her face against the floor with all of the strength I had in my arms. Her nose broke first with a riveting crackle and the thick stream of her blood dribbling from her mouth to the floor filled me with a head rush. I insisted on my action, smashing her face into the ground until there was no strength left in her to resist me. The warmth of her body and the pulsations of blood through her veins intimidated me of her state, and I turned her over. No one is going to love you like me. I cried when I saw her crushed face. The night had a dizzying aura to it. The swirling tip of cigarette smoke swirling across the desk that separated me from the bartender as he whipped a cocktail for a customer who sat two seats to my right. The heavy air of nostalgia that always returned with every Halloween made me aware of all the motions in the room. I turned my neck to face the small dais at the center of the bar, and there she was, the singer, crooning into the night like an angel recounting a debauched incident of sex on a beach. I fancy no one took too much notice of me as I did of the room. I enjoyed the anonymity well enough, it served its purpose. My mind rallied back to the present, latching onto the bartender's finger around the cup as he wound the tall, shaking cup around and finally settled the drink in front of the customer. 
Perhaps she did not notice it, but his left little finger had a plaster around the cuticle. I tucked my left little fingernail away instinctively and grappled my drink from the base. I pushed the tip of the glass to my mouth and took a swig of the alcohol. It burnt down my throat with a sting. When I returned my gaze to the table, she was staring at me. I blushed. I fancy you enjoy your own company more than most people do, she said to me, pressing for a conversation which I had not known to allow before she spoke. Her body was turned to face me in rapt attention. That's Halloween. Some time for reflection, maybe. I said back to her with a smile on the left corner of my face. Hmm, introspective. I like that. So what are you supposed to be tonight? She asked, her brows jutting up her forehead and causing it to crease. Um, no, buddy. Just me, I replied. Can you guess what I am, then? She asked. She bobbed her hair over her shoulder and simpered as I assessed her briefly. I looked over my shoulder, and the room was distracted by the events of the evening. The only attention we got was from the bartender, who eavesdropped subtly. He looked familiar, but I would never mention it to her. I squinted as I drew in as much of her features as I could. She had an artificial brow attached to her face, loose and unkempt. But she had the better habit of making sure her hair was well tended to. It was thick and ginger. But her eyes were different colors, one green and the other blue. She affected some wrinkles on her face, which I considered well done. Her lips had a maroon stain on the side, drawn to resemble a blood-stained canvas. It was strange, but I had no idea what it was. Um, I don't think I do, I answered truthfully. Maggie the drunk, she blurted. Her eyes lit up with such fascination when she spoke. I don't think I know who that is, I replied, feeling the heat of the alcohol starting to pool back into my mouth. She's a figure from the old world. They say she would seize children who strayed too far from home, and when she had them, she would slit their throats with a small pick, just enough to get some blood and then drink of it until those little pricks would turn white. She giggled jocularly, managing her attention between myself and the bartender. And you, what are you supposed to be? She added, questioning him. I turned to my drink and stirred in silence with my ears pitched to hear what he had to say. Richard Combs. Heard a podcast about him from the internet. They say he's on the loose. A serial killer with no pattern. Scary, isn't it? The bartender said, fascinated with his own narration as he was with telling the subject of the story. Oh, I wouldn't know him she said dismissively, and threw her hands in the air as she took a sip of her drink. I had enough of the night, and I took the last of my drink just before sliding the bartender his tip of ten dollars for the night. I belched the alcohol crudely and stood up for the night without attention for the rest of bargoers. The breeze was gentle on my face when I stepped out of the bar that evening, and I felt a powerfulness that overwhelmed me. I felt alive. I recognized the rush and knew I had to satisfy it even as I made my way to the car. There was only so much I could do in such a place as this where I was new in, I thought to myself as I devised a new plan for my week ahead. I marched to my car with the thoughts swirling in my head, distracting me from finding my car, when I heard the faint whisper from behind. I shuddered in the dark as I looked around to find bare nothingness in my trail. The bar was at least three minutes from where I stood. Still, it felt like a distant island to me when I was stranded at sea. I walked backwards briefly, and just as I turned around, the ginger-haired costume was before me. What are the odds that you're being stalked by someone who wants the taste of your blood on her tongue right now? She asked rhetorically. I looked around and twitched. We were all alone. The feeling of powerfulness surged in me, pumping my muscles and causing my veins to spasm with a sudden rush of blood. I would place them very high, she said to me as she moved in with a small knife in her fingers. I said nothing. I could not. I was already pale with breathlessness and my nose was hot with anticipation as I stared into her eyes to see her carelessness. I felt my head spin, and I lost my own consciousness like one possessed to speak. 
<laughs> she bucked into a chuckle. Look at you, almost white with dread. You should see your eyes. I was just kidding. May I see your knife? I said to her as she moved closer. Sure, she said and handed over the knife to me. My name's Maggie. Reason for the choice on Halloween. What's yours? My eyes lit up. Richard Combs. Who? She asked, suddenly curious. Richard Combs, I said, slipping my left hand from the dark to have a firm grip on the knife. I tucked the knife quickly into my hand and placed my plastered finger on the base. Oh, oh God, no, she cried when she saw the look on my face. I grabbed her arm before she could turn. The fury in my veins flooded my face and I was red with rage before I could put a lid on my emotions. I dug the knife straight into the left side of her neck and pulled it across. I withdrew the knife from her neck before I realized what I had done. Morning, Richard. What would you like for breakfast, hun? The radiant beam of my mom shone out throughout the kitchen. She truly was a brilliant, gentle, and kind being. I miss her so much. She could have been here, too, if it wasn't for my mistake. Uh, I'm okay, Mom. Just gonna head off to school now. I blurted with a dull, plain-sounding tone. Enough for her to hear, but avoiding any reply of excitement or embarrassment as I left her house. Hearing her still shout out, Bye, hun! Love you! The words dimly made it to my ears as I turned the corner, heading off to a nearby coffee shop just a mile or so away. Once I arrived, I felt the sweet aroma of coffee and cake warming my nostrils as I went in and took a seat on one of the sofas wedged in the corner of the room. Finally, I was alone. I smiled at the cashier and opened my school bag to pull out my laptop from within, alongside a mammoth pair of headphones that engulfed my head as I strapped them on, ready to start the day's work. And now, to open it all up. I flipped on the power button attached to my laptop and entered a 20-digit code. Then, entered a second set of passwords, unlocking the virtual networks that created a haven for me to roam the darkest corners of the internet. Even to witness some of the most diabolical, disturbing videos. The images and pop-ups displaying things like organs and animals for sale. This was my delve into a world not often seen by the light of day. Even with the police at constant war with it, the dark web stood tall. Fear often crept into me when I first became a user of this forbidden place. Very often I would scream and shut the laptop off after seeing scarring visuals that morph the once innocent mind that Locke's blank slate can never escape. But as I endured the havoc and mayhem that swirled all over the internet at its general use level, I found it to be mundane. Each time trying to watch some random man playing a game that I could play better, it was utter misery. I wanted an escape. So I did what any normal person should do, and broke free. For a few months I practiced hacking, coding, skipping school, even setting up my own online store, hidden to the naked eye of those around me. It turns out that there is a lucrative market in a certain trade that deconstructs the mind to a primitive level of sadistic entertainment. After breaking into my own school's network system, purely to raise my attendance score to avoid tipping off my parents, I shortly discovered that many systems seen today were often protected by a weak password, which a basic algorithm can solve in nanoseconds. This gave me access to my product. I logged into several users' accounts all over the dark web. One of the main financially beneficial industries were torture videos, often slowly dismembering a person, usually all the way down to the bone, then if they survived, pouring salt over the bare flesh and setting loose several goats, which licked the person's maimed body into pure skeleton, leaving all but the eyes and brain still connected to the spine which were then sold off via a bid. It was an easy task stealing these videos, and without putting myself in harm's way whatsoever. Or so I thought at the time. I was making thousands in just a day. 
The money then went to a bank account under my Brazilian uncle's name, and it was another quick transfer job to deposit the money back into my account. It was fantastic. But that day, as I sat down in my coffee shop, the moment I opened the laptop and entered a series of passwords, a new message popped up. Hi there, Richard. Just wanted to let you know that I've had enough of you taking my videos. I have your address, 15206 Pittsburgh, PA, and we'll shortly be sending several guys armed with machetes, rope, and a drill to tie your mother to a chair. Then, drill holes in each limb of hers, filling each hole with a chunk of flesh from your father, who will be hacked to death the moment he opens the door. Then, finishing the job, which I promise you, Richard, will be undertaking using a set of hedge clippers. Have a great rest of your day, Richard, and if you ever steal from me again, I will personally come and find you and skin you to make a new lampshade. Never fuck with me again, Richard. This is merely a warning. The world felt limp, devoid of all laws of human nature. My parents, they had nothing to do with this. Please, God, save them. It was at that point my mom called. The ringing sounded angelic. She wasn't mincemeat yet? God had intervened. Thank you. Wrong. Hello, Richard. I'm sorry, but your dad and I just found out from these lovely gentlemen outside what you've been up to. They're sat down at the dinner table now. I think you best be hurrying home. They look furious. The line cut out before I could even move my mouth. My mom was about to be sliced and diced. My father to be turned into a pile of lifeless flesh and guts. I was so scared. I dialed 911 shortly after, and after notifying them of the message and the danger my parents were in, confessed to it all. The police arrived moments later, both here at the coffee shop and miles away at my home. Later that evening, I was able to return to my parents. Neither were alive. My mom, reduced to a chunk of meat, sprayed with holes. My dad, well, he was scattered across the floor, the carpet drenched in his blood. I wasn't supposed to see it. The police tried holding me back, but my parents, I needed them. But there was nobody there for me, and my ravenous greed for wealth had caused it all. They, of course, never located the man with the message, the creature sat behind a screen somewhere. A troll, a gremlin, a nothing, a nobody, a waste of life. That man deserved only God's other half. But even the wrath of the divine does not even begin to describe what awaits him in hell. Me. I was sent to juvie for a while after the incident. It devolved quickly after I started taking my vengeance out on the others. My first cellmate, Patrick... I turned him into a doormat as he slept, skinning him with nothing but my teeth as I took pleasure in watching him shriek in agony. I kept it up like that for years until they sent me to prison. There I began torturing the other criminals, manipulating many into doing my bidding, offering them sanctity from my urge for pain. It made their reaction to me slitting their chests open ever so much more pleasing. Eventually, they caught on to the fact I would never stop. Not until he was found, and certainly not until I had eaten both his eyes, ripped out each individual tooth, nail, hair, eyelash, the lot from his trembling body, then cut off each limb, then ending it off by dipping him in and out of a tub of acid until the shock killed him. Tomorrow, I'll be strapped to a chair and then the needles will inject poison into my arms, laying me to rest for the final time. I give one final message to the many families who desire to see me dead. I'll be waiting. You will never escape from me. I shall punish you all. I was about 11 years old when my parents divorced. They had absolutely hated each other. They never seemed to stop at the fighting, the arguing, the shouting, and the person who it affected the most was me. 
My mom managed to win custody over me based on my dad's drinking issues, but we were originally quite poor. So, with the loss of half the household income, we should have been in a state of pure poverty. But according to my mom at the time, our luck had turned around. Days after the last papers went through in the final stages of the divorce, my mom met a man called Harry. Harry was incredibly wealthy. I even managed to find out about their relationship. After I saw my mom come home each night wearing a new set of expensive jewelry, and every time I would question her on how she got the money, she would always answer with a shallow grin, then told me to go to bed. Eventually, I was able to meet Harry. We were moving into his house, after all. He was a tall man, about six feet in height, and radiated confidence and wealth alike. His hair was slicked back, and he was always well-dressed. To me, it felt like he was covering for something. His house was a colossal structure, containing several master bedrooms, and was ornately decorated with marble pillars. Though I was always one to notice the cracks. I would point them out, too, only to receive a deathly stare from my mom, followed by an eerie chuckle from Harry. In just a couple of nights, I started growing in my urge to discover who this man really was. Especially as one thing he refused to say continued to haunt me, causing me countless restless nights. I needed to know. The question I repeatedly posed to him was, Where does all your money come from, Harry? To which he would grow a dark glance in appearance, and my mom would retort with, Don't be rude, John. It's inconsiderate to ask people about money. I knew my manners, but I also knew when someone was lying. He would always answer with the same dark glance and ignore it. What was he hiding? I began to explore the house, walking round the gleaming corridors at night, attempting to discover the detestable underbelly of this glamorous abode. Yet I could never find anything. That was the case at least until one day, whilst clampering past an old painting left on the side of the wall in the corridor, I noticed my steps seemed to echo only when in the area adjacent to the painting. I paced backwards and forward past it, testing if my theory was true, until I decided to take a look behind the painting, which bore an odd resemblance to Harry, and gave an even more extreme facade of true wealth. Lifting the painting up ever so slightly, I noticed a beam of light shining through a rather large gap in the wall. Realizing that suddenly I had found something. What do you think you're doing, Jonathan? A foul voice echoed from behind me as I jumped out of my skin, swerving my head round to see who called for my name. It was one of Harry's butlers. Or, rather, one of his slaves. The butler's face looked wrinkled and bruised in areas, and there came a lifeless aura about his eyes as I spoke to him. Uh, nothing. I saw this painting here and thought I could try lifting it back onto the wall. He nodded, and he grabbed the other end, and in one swift action, we lifted it back onto the wall. I thanked him and pretended to move away, only to scuttle back moments later as I heard his steps fade off into the corridor down the other end. I darted back over to the crack, peered through. I felt my body seize up in fright. Through the gap, I was bearing witness to several women, all locked in cages, with camera equipment lodged all over, with their lenses set on the captives. There were countless wounds, scars, bruises that were scattered over their bodies. Their mouths were taped shut, hence why I never heard them before this. The rest of the room was lined with clubs, bats, whips, chains, and a whole assortment of different weaponry, all capable of delivering torture to anyone they could reach. I fell back in shock, and the walls around me felt like they were warping into smiles and grins alike. I was thrown into a state of pure terror, and so I reacted just as any other 11-year-old would have, and sprinted back to my room with tears flooding my eyes. I laid in bed that night, thinking only of the poor, tortured souls that were hidden behind the marble walls and fake smiles. Then, I remembered my mom. I leapt out of bed and threw myself into a full sprint down the corridor to find my mom's room. We needed to get out of there quick before she became a prisoner too. I slowed down as I approached the room, just so Harry wouldn't hear me if he was in there with her. Unfortunately, as I snuck closer towards the bed frame, standing over my mom's empty bed, stood Harry, 
with a bloodied hatchet clutched into his arms. My mind fell into a trance. Did he hit my mom? Did he put her in the cave as well? Was she alive? I could feel nothing aside from all these crazy thoughts running across my mind. It truly pierced me with such a morbid reality that I simply couldn't cope. And as I lost feeling in my legs and hit the floor, I too had just doomed myself to an eternal silencing of my life. Hearing the thud of my back hitting the ground, Harry swiveled round, bearing a demonic smile as he slowly crept up towards me, bearing the hatchet in his arms, raising it high, ready to strike. You know, John, I always wanted a son. The hatchet he was gripping came down on my legs, severing them from my torso. I screamed! But only internally. My body had completely shut down. And although I could feel my veins being lacerated by the metal axe, I could make no attempt to flee. And endurance seemed to be all I had left in this life. He took me to his study. He injected some narcotic into my bloodstream, filling it with a sense of drowsiness. And ever since that day, I've been sewn to this wretched wheelchair. Then, been forced to tell the story repeatedly into one of his little cameras that he then sells to vermin like you on the dark web. He'll be here soon. If you're reading, watching, or listening, please stop buying this. Let him end my suffering. I can't go on any longer. Please, help! For the sake of this report, my name shall be Jones. I am 42 years old, and since I was a teenager, I always had problems with accepting the established rules when it comes to a society. I wasn't a rebel without a cause by any means. I simply didn't believe in living a life of submission. And for what? Governments are corrupt, and all sorts of respected authority, both public and private, treat people like sheep and pieces of boarding chess. Yes, I was born an intelligent individual, so even during my youth I was questioning the world that surrounded me. When it came for me to finally start earning my own money, I already had a few ideas. At first I was buying and selling all sorts of items, both used and new, books, music records, video games. I had my own small place, and I would also meet people at their homes for the transactions. It wasn't bad. The money wasn't too much, but it was still coming, and I was making some kind of profit. For starters, it was enough for me to feel excited about the prospect of relying on my independence and creativity. However, I was thirsty. I needed more money. And as my ideas supported free will and the right of the individual to decide for himself, I started selling. Obviously, the money was even better, but it came with a problem. I realized I was being seduced by those and I didn't want to become an addict myself. My own decision, precisely. So I left that life. I was now searching for another, liberal business. I met a guy who had fascinating ideas about anarchy as a political system. Let's call him Henry. Can you imagine the society breathing without government, without police, without any kind of oppressive institution? churches, big companies, Henry would say. But then, it would be chaos, right? I argued. At first, yes. But it's like everything in life, the universe itself. After chaos comes balance, and with balance comes fairness. In due time, all social groups would simply make peace among themselves. And freedom! Wars wouldn't need to happen because there would be no more political and economical interests behind them. Henry was actually making good points. I think I follow you, man, I said. But for that, we need guns, Jones. To sell them, to spread them out there. That's the business I'm into now. But don't worry, I don't sell them to everyone, only to people in organizations that have similar ideas, that want to make things right. I'm now working with some guys who call themselves Fury for Freedom. I'm selling them some guns. If you want to work for me, Jones, you will be receiving a lot of money and doing something good at the same time. What do you say? Henry proposed. 
Okay, I'm in, I replied. My friend Henry explained to me how it worked. I was to dwell into the dark web through an illegal site and then deal with the people from Fury for Freedom, discussing prices, types of guns, how many, etc. Henry gave me the keys to a warehouse which had a secret underground floor. There I could get access to the guns. How they got in there, I never asked. By driving a truck, I was able to put the guns inside the truck, and then I would take them to the guys from Fury for Freedom. And this is what I did. After reaching an agreement through our dark web communications, I was now driving my truck to finally meet the gentleman from Fury for Freedom. Once I arrived to the address they gave me, I was in for a surprise. It was a huge, luxurious mansion. They opened the gates and let me in. I was given directions to park my loaded truck inside a big garage, which I did. I was nervous. There were about eight individuals. One of them, a woman, no older than 30 years old, ordered me to get out of the truck after it was parked. Hello, welcome my fellow freedom fighter. Call me Donna, she said, shaking my hand. The woman was friendly and quite attractive, short blonde hair and big fiery brown eyes. I quickly understood she was the leader of the gang. The remaining individuals were now inspecting the contents of the truck. I had brought about a hundred guns, from simple 9mm to machine guns. After confirming that everything was fine, I was paid. Here, some extra for you, Donna said, as she gave me an additional $500. Call it a tip. Thank you, I said, genuinely grateful. Then Donna invited me to come inside the house. Her fellows, all men, from 20 to 50 years old, give or take, came with us. I was served vodka and caviar. I assumed Donna had some Slavic origins, probably, although her accent didn't reveal it, if being the case. As we were eating and drinking, I was getting a nice session of Fury for Freedom propaganda, agreeing with part of it, but thinking, these guys are a little bit too much. Oh well, better than the government still. And suddenly, I was about to be questioned about that. We heard shots from outside the house. Massive shots, not your average handgun. Someone came in the house, one of Donna's guards. He was bleeding, badly. The police is here! Special forces, we're doomed! Donna was livid. You brought them with you, bastard! Traitor! She screamed at me. No, I didn't! I shouted back, sincerely. In a few minutes, the special forces were spread around Donna's property, outdoors and indoors. Better trained and benefiting from the element of surprise, they killed or captured all of the members of Fury for Freedom, at least those who were at the mansion. As for Donna, she chose to die with a gun from her own hand, not so far away from where I was. The government's troops didn't play safe and spread Donna with a massive blaze of semi-automatic shooting. She was dead within seconds, and some of her blood was spilled right onto my face. I felt terrible for all the reasons and more. Ironically, in spite of bringing all those weapons with me to the property, I can barely shoot a gun. So I wasn't armed and surrendered immediately. It wasn't even an option. It was the only possible outcome. Once the beasts from the special forces looked at me, they probably realized how scared I was shaking with my hands up. For sure, I don't have that kind of look in my eyes, the one of a soldier or a fighter. Later on, I learned what happened. My friend Henry was caught by the police doing illegal business months ago. In exchange for a reduced sentence, he became their double agent. Henry was the typical two-faced rat. I obviously fell for it and became his puppet, without knowing, of course. I went to trial, was found guilty, and now I'm serving 20 years in prison. And I hate the government more than ever. This story is inspired from a bizarre and sad occurrence of a model getting cheap lip fillers to enhance her lips. All was well, till one morning she woke up with uneven lips which oozed pus. Everyone was always commending me for my skill. I was good at it, especially with my lips. 
men received the pleasure they wanted, whether it was on their lips or some other part of their body or somewhere else, and my mouth always did the job well. My best friend May even commended me once. Or maybe it wasn't a commendation because it led to a fight. I had slept with her boyfriend. The moron told her I was better in bed than she was. But to be honest, it wasn't my fault. He asked for it. And because I was good at my job, I gave in and gave him all the pleasure he ever wanted and more. May was pissed with me for days. Well, scratch that, her anger almost lasted a month. Now, I broke my ties with her boyfriend because of her, and she broke up with him because of me, but she refused to forgive me for so long. It didn't make sense to me because the guy who got between us was out of our lives. I was so glad when she finally did. She was the best thing that ever happened to me, and I didn't want to lose her. We had been friends since childhood. Being orphans, we grew up as each other's backbone from the orphanage and other stages of life. We didn't have to cut ties for a seamless man. Not that I wasn't shamelessly promiscuous, but it wasn't the same thing. I remember convincing her that I was addicted to all things sexual, and there was nothing I could do about it. No matter how much everyone advised me to stop sleeping around with multiple men at the same time, I couldn't stop. It was my life. It was also for the same reason that I needed lip fillers. I was doing a good job with my lips already, but I wanted fuller and prettier lips. I wanted to give the babies some confidence on their own, but I didn't know where to get the fillers. I'd never gotten one before, and I wasn't vast in that area. May was. I sought her help, and I was glad when she started talking to me like her old self and agreed to help me out. It was like good old days. May recommended a salon. It seemed a bit shady, but the good part was that the services they offered were in my budget. The fillers were inexpensive compared to what I had read online. And the pink beauties became more beautiful and fuller indeed. If my job was simply good before, I became even better at pleasing men, and more of them came to me. My sex life had never been this good. At some point, May's ex returned, and although I didn't tell her, we ended up having sex again. My sleeping around didn't stop and the lip fillers encouraged me to do a better job. All was heaven, until the first rip. At first, I didn't understand what was going on. One morning, I woke up and was shocked to see my face in the mirror. My lips were bigger than usual and slightly uneven. It didn't make sense. They were normal before I went to sleep. Scared, I rushed to the parlor and confronted the lady who had done my procedure. She told me that this was a minor side effect and would settle down on its own. She had done hundreds of procedures in the past and the fillers were of top quality. There was no need to be scared. Her words relaxed my mind and I returned home. But the next morning was worse. My lips had swollen up like giant balloons and were more uneven than yesterday. While I was trying to examine the lips, I found that there was a rip and pus had started to leak. I screamed and cried at the same time, but I couldn't keep up with it for long because it caused my lips to hurt me all the more. That was the beginning of what I could say was the dark period in my life. Every living moment of mine was full of pain and agony. I could barely look at myself. The sight of my face in the mirror gave me the creeps, and my lips leaked pus all day long. The yellowish sometimes white-colored liquid irritated my lips, and I felt like I would die. I covered my face and rushed to the parlor once more. I should have known something was wrong from the start. The fillers were so cheap and showed results almost immediately. I should have figured out that I was duped and scammed. The lady refused to accept her wrongdoing and blamed me for creating a scene. Seeing her nonchalant attitude, I proceeded to slap her, but my arm was caught midair by a man. I know girls like you. You just want to have your fun, and when things go wrong, you blame me, you ugly bitch. The man picked me up and threw me out on the street. I didn't know what to do. I was completely broken. The police won't do anything since it wasn't technically a medical procedure. I cried my eyes out. 
No man would want to sleep with me or seek me for pleasure. I was devastated. Till that moment, it never occurred to me that the one who sent me to that parlor had ulterior motives. May stopped visiting me. Heck, she wouldn't even pick up my calls. She claimed that my house smelled like men, and I was always the one to visit her. A week later, I was surprised that day when May came into my house. But she was less surprised seeing me with big lips that were leaking pus. She looked like she was expecting to see just that. I broke down in front of her, crying tears of my hurt. You deserve it, May spoke in a cold manner. I didn't need any more convincing that she had done it on purpose. She hadn't forgiven me. She didn't forget it in her heart that I had slept with her boyfriend, and she had chosen to destroy my lips in return. She was there in my house, petting me and asking me to stop crying, that it'll be fine, that at least now I wouldn't sleep around with men. She was hugging me, but I could hear the sinister smile in her voice. I could feel the loud thumping of her heart in joy about how I looked, about how horrible she had made my precious lips. I pushed her away. You are a monster, May! I screamed at her to get out! And the surprise was evident in her eyes until her lips curled up in a mischievous grin. Her mouth formed the words, You didn't expect to simply get away like that after making my boyfriend cheat on me. She winked at me as she uttered the words, and my heart broke into a million pieces. She slapped me hard across the face and pushed me into my bed, leaving me in tears. Now you won't go around sleeping with men with that terrible look. I hope you never get to use those lips again. She laughed and left the house. I went to the hospital the next week. I needed all the help I could get. I may have lost my beauty, but I didn't have to lose myself, too. Although my lips didn't return to being exactly as pretty as they used to, after a few surgeries, the pus stopped and my lips healed. I have never used cheap fillers ever since. I learned my lesson the hard way. Now I'm saving every penny that I can. This time, I would have a proper surgery from a trained expert. My name is Adrian, and I study medicine in university. Last year, we experienced a chaotic and unexpected episode. As I was having one of my classes, someone from the university staff came in and warned us that a massive shooting was taking place outside. The reasons were still unknown. Nevertheless, as long as the police didn't solve the situation, and hence before it was completely safe for us to leave, the university was closed. No one could come in or leave. It was a dark, late afternoon in early December. It was also raining. This made things more difficult for the authorities when trying to catch the bad guys. And to finally consider that everything was back to normal. As normal as it gets in an American big city. So I figured we were about to spend a generous amount of hours locked in our own university. Now at first, almost everyone was alarmed. We could actually listen to the shooting spreading from the exterior. They were coming from different areas, some closer than others. I was more excited and curious than scared, to be honest. All the doors were now shut, and the university became our bunker. Teachers and students on the same boat, discussing what was happening inside classrooms, laboratories, corridors, and, of course, the cafeteria. The nocturnal hours arrived soon enough, as it was December. I was sitting on some stairs with my best friend Celia, in a quiet area close to the university's attic. No one ever went there. The building, although refurbished, was originally quite old. Several sections were added throughout the decades. Imagine a Lego construction in which you start with a small model, but are allowed to build more and more. That's pretty much what happened. Well, different kind of day and night. There'll be an interesting story to tell throughout the rest of our lives, I said to Celia as I lit a cigarette. You're not allowed to smoke inside, Adrian, Celia said. I think we were best friends because we complimented each other. She was always so nervous, and I the opposite. 
I think no one cares. Most students and teachers are on the lower levels of the building. It's fine. Just relax, Celia. Maybe we'll be interviewed when we get out. That would be cool, I said. What do you think's happening? Gang activity? Terrorist attacks? Celia asked. Those are two possible hypotheses, definitely. These days, guess you never know. Even someone who lost his job or his wife and wants to take revenge upon the civilized world. A well-trained individual with a couple of guns can produce a lot of damage. Want to smoke? I said. No, I'm fine, Celia replied. Both of us had already spoken to our families through our cell phones. Sometimes these things do become helpful, I have to admit. After a while, I got bored and asked Celia if she wanted to explore the attic. That's probably full of rats, Adrian. I hope not, with the amount of money my parents pay to keep me studying here. Come on, it'll be fun, I insisted. Uh, okay, okay, Celia finally agreed. I was always able to convince Celia to do the fun stuff with me. Deep inside, I thought she loved that side of me. We went upstairs and tried to open the massive door. With no surprise, it was closed. Fortunately for me, and due to my adventurous personality, one of my ex-boyfriends was kind of a bad boy, so he taught me how to open locks with simple items, such as paper clips, for example. As students, we have tons of those things with us. It took me a few minutes, but I managed to open the door. The room was actually enormous, like a hall. I tried to switch on the lights, but they weren't working. Once again, the cell phones were useful for that. Inside, there were lots of books, and also old laboratory devices, as well as old hospital beds. Not uncommon in a medicine faculty. There were also many boxes, of course. Both me and Celia were now opening those boxes, just for the sake of it. It was fun. I felt like I was opening a forbidden surprise Christmas gift. The smaller boxes only had more books, and even some sports-related objects, like a football, for example. I saw a couple of uniforms, which were once part of the university soccer team, from the time in which there were sorts of championships between different institutions of the same kind. But there was a big box, horizontal, placed on the very end of the attic, hidden behind broomsticks and buckets, and under a dirty gray blanket that captured my attention. Hey, Celia, there's one box left. Maybe we'll find some treasure here. Sure is huge in comparison with the others, I said, approaching the box. Sure. It's shaped like a coffin, Celia answered. Celia, always so morbid. I love it, I replied. When I opened that box, I realized Celia was right. Inside, there were two skeletons. One of a grown-up, the other belonging to a child. Now, in theory, this could also be normal in a medicine faculty, but the skeletons had clothes. Celia almost screamed, but I managed to stop her. Quiet, Celia! Who could these people be? Or, or better said, who were they? We must report this, Adrian! And for once, I agreed with my friend. But still, my sixth sense advised me in doing things my way. We will report this, yes but to the police, not to anyone from the university, all right? Of course, it's good enough for me. This is creepy. Indeed it was. The next morning, the police finally released us from our own protective lockdown, and I informed the authorities about the skeletons in the attic. Later on, one of our teachers, Dr. Crane, was arrested. The skeletons belonged to his dead wife and daughter. Dr. Crane was the one who murdered them, Having the keys and access to pretty much all the rooms in the university, after poisoning his wife and daughter, a very clean way to commit murder, he took them there, and during the night, their corpses already placed inside that big box. The reasons behind the murder were not clear, but sometimes brilliant minds just crack and primal killing instincts take place. Dr. Crane's field of study was precisely the brain, and it had been the perfect crime. But Dr. Crane was very unlucky. If those shootings didn't happen, he would probably never have been caught. As for the shootings themselves, they were just a bunch of drunk junkies who were out for adventure and easy money, of course. 
One of them was shot dead, and the others were captured throughout the night. No civilian casualties. A couple of police officers were shot, but they were taken to the hospital and recovered. I like to think that Dr. Crane is sharing a cell with the shooter from that night who was caught. Love to see the look on the good doctor's face when knowing that his cellmate was indirectly the reason for his arrest. That day, Yasmin wore a red lace corset with the tiniest skirt I had ever seen and red lace knee-high socks to match. She danced on the shiny silver pole, slowly spinning round with the rhythm of the sensual song playing in the background. And I'd never wished so hard for my laptop screen to be bigger than it was. When she got to the bottom of the pole, a sultry smile crossed her pink, plump lips as she gave a very low curtsy, and I could practically see the top of her boobs straining against the corset. Yasmin was so beautiful that she literally turned me on any time I logged into her OnlyFans. The show was over for today, and I closed my laptop and sighed, dreading going to work the next day. Working as a salesman at a car dealership was very draining, and I could literally feel my soul being sucked out every time I clocked in. But Dave, my work friend, made it manageable, and it paid the bills, kept the lights on, and that was all that mattered. Besides, I had Yasmin to keep me company. One week later, I slammed the door to my apartment and slid the bolt in the lock. Work had been particularly brutal that week. Who knew trying to sell an Audi to a guy who could probably afford ten of them without batting an eyelid would be so stressful? And to top it off, my boss was on my case for being late the third time that week and I was too tired to come up with a good excuse. I placed the tiny plastic bag on my kitchen counter and stared at the blue pills with smiley faces stamped into them. I needed to take the edge off, and he was just what the doctor prescribed. Well, that was what I told myself, to stop feeling guilty for buying from a kid in a grimy alley. I sat on my couch and turned on my laptop, before shaking the pills into my upturned palm. I had to admit that the smiley face was kind of cute, and I couldn't wait for the high that I was about to experience. He wasn't the only I was familiar with, but it was my favorite. I navigated my way to Yasmin's OnlyFans page, and today she was in a ring-length lingerie set. And while she danced, the pills were starting to kick in. The pleasure didn't last as Yasmin's face began to drip. Now at first I thought it was just her makeup that had gone a little funny when her red lipstick began to drip down her chin. But when blood from the corner of her eyes started dripping down her cheeks like runny eggs, I knew something was wrong. The music in the background sounded garbled. And when Yasmin laughed, it wasn't cheery and high-pitched, it was static and grated my ears. I sat up and rubbed my eyes, but that made it worse, as her whole face began to melt and drip down her neck and shoulders, leaving only her bloody skull with empty eye sockets. My heart dropped to my stomach as I slammed my laptop shut. I never experienced anything like that while I was high before. I rushed to the kitchen, filled a glass with water, and gulped it down, hoping it would wash whatever that was happening to me away. But when I flipped the screen open, Yasmin's face was still melted. And this time, it was grinning at me. And I knew I had to lay off for a while. Three days later, Cash or credit, came the nasally voice of the cashier. I pulled out my wallet and handed her my card, while the young guy beside her bagged my items. It was a slow evening in the convenience store, and all I wanted to do was go home and sleep. It would have been nice to be with a real girl, instead of jerking off to Yasmin every night, but all the ladies that had ever given me a shot felt like I was a loser, and I just couldn't waste my time trying anymore. Here's your card, sir. Have a nice evening. I looked up at her, and the air was knocked out of my lungs. The skin on her face had melted, just like Yasmin's three days ago, and all I could see from her neck up was her grinning skull. I blinked repeatedly, willing the image to go away, but the grinning skull was still there. I turned to the guy beside her, and it was the same. 
I stumbled backwards, my heart slamming in my throat as their garbled voices filled my ears. I hadn't taken any so why was this happening to me? I ran towards my car, abandoning the things I had bought, and drove home, hands white on the steering wheel. But it only grew worse, as all the faces I saw, from my neighbors, to Dave's, to customers at the dealership, were all distorted and scared stiff. I resorted to staying indoors. Dave came to check on me one day, pounding on my door, but I was afraid to move, scared of what I'd see. I'm not leaving until you open this door, Owen! I swung the door open with my eyes closed, and I could hear Dave laugh. <laughs> What's up with you? I thought you were dead or something since you haven't been to work in weeks. You've not been picking up your phone either. I didn't know if I should tell him what was going on with me, but he was the closest thing to a real friend I had. It wouldn't hurt to try. I have been seeing things, Dave, I said, my voice shaking. What kind of things? As if on cue, his face slowly distorted, dripping down and revealing a slimy skull that left me shocked. It's happening again, I whispered. Trying to calm my nerves that were scattered all over my small living room, I explained everything that was happening to me. And Dave suggested I see a doctor, though I wasn't too keen on the idea. I was worried he was going to just assume it was even though I hadn't touched any in weeks. But after careful consideration, I decided to give it a shot. A few months later, I looked at the tiny white pill in my hand and sighed. It wasn't a or anything fun, but was prescribed by the doctor, who diagnosed me with schizophrenia after a few months of carrying out tests. Turns out the I took triggered it, causing auditory and visual hallucinations. Though I was already vulnerable, following a history of schizophrenia in my family. It took a long time for the pills to finally work, before I was able to go back to being a functional human being, returning to work, and seeing Yasmin's gorgeous body again swinging round the pole. I filled a glass with water and tossed the pill into my mouth, gulped the water down, and then ampled to my couch and turned on my laptop, logging into OnlyFans. Yasmin was waiting. And today, she was dressed in white lace. As this girl was about to collect her order, a short dude came out of nowhere and snatched it from her. The whole incident happened in a matter of seconds, and the guy recording the video was left baffled and annoyed. This video was posted by a TikTok user, Nicomode9. The following is an animated story inspired from the video you just witnessed. Mondays were hell. There was always too much to do at work and too little time to do it. I was always left feeling wretched and dead at the end of each day. It didn't help that my girlfriend also worked the same long hours as I did. That meant that at the end of the day we were both too tired to make dinner. This was where Burger King delivery came in. We ordered two takeaway parks and my girlfriend, Sophia, went out to collect the order. My stomach growled loudly. My hunger had intensified. I couldn't wait to devour the food. However, it seemed like the delivery guy was taking his sweet time. What's the holdup? I asked. He's getting it, Sophia replied. She already had the cash in her hands. Just as Sophia handed the cash and tried to collect the packet, a scrawny little dude snatched the takeaway from her. It was quick, like a flash. Hey, Sophia cried, stop! All of the frustration which I had endured at work broke free from the little mental cell where I'd lock them all up. Now they were all going to be let loose on the thieving idiot with our takeaways. Sophia and the delivery guy were still staring open-mouthed, the scrawny guy was fast, but I was faster. The takeaways he had in his hand were impeding his movement. A few meters down the block, he flung them away violently. Our dinner flew through the air and landed up splat on the road. Just as I feared, the packs didn't withstand the hit. The food poured out all over the asphalt. And just like that, the dinner Sophia and I had paid for was wasted. Now I was seeing red. My heart was 
pounding hard as I ran into the alleyway. It was when I was well over ten steps into it that I realized it was too dark for me to see well. I slowed down to look around. There was no sign of the scrawny guy. My panting was the only sound to be heard. I squinted hard into the darkness while I waited for my pupils to dilate and adapt. A rustle to my left, slightly behind me, intruded on the silence. I pivoted to take a look, and was instead blinded by a bright flash of light. Pain exploded in my skull and my center of gravity shifted. I hit the ground with a grunt and clutched at my head to keep the pain from tearing it apart. You should have let me go! A swoosh alerted me of an incoming blow just moments before it connected with my back. Only a club or a bat could inflict the amount of pain that seared through my side. I cried out in renewed agony and scrambled to my hands and knees to crawl away. Then another blow caught me in the head. This one threw me back to the ground. I'm hungry! Do you understand that? All I understood was the pain that was burning through my head and my side. I didn't understand anything else. I wasn't even sure who was talking. My easiest guess was that it was the scrawny guy. However, the voice was a deep rumble. Not something you'd expect from a guy as thin as he was. It was me or you, he continued. The food or your life! Darkness crowded in on me. This darkness was different from the darkest of the night. It was oblivion, dragging me down into its void where nothing had any meaning. On my bed, under the covers, and with Sophia resting her head on my chest, it would have been welcome. However, out here, in a dark alleyway, with my body racked with pain and a batshit crazy psycho attacking me, it was the last thing I needed. So I fought it with all the mental strength I could muster. You chose the food, didn't you? The crazy bastard asked me. Now you're going to die. No! I groaned and tried to get up from the ground, but my body had already sustained a lot of damage. My spirit was half broken too. As I stood up, my legs started to shake and I collapsed to the ground once more, a sickening fear ballooning out of the pit of my stomach. I knew another blow and I'd be dead for sure. I could hardly protect myself. I'll kill you! My attacker shouted. I'll barbecue your limbs right here and eat every last bit of flesh. Gone was all the rage that had driven me into this alleyway. In its place now was pain and pure terror. A heavy trail of warm liquid was making its way down the side of my face and the back of my neck. I didn't need anyone to tell me it was blood. I also didn't need anybody to tell me my hand was going to be useless for a while. The darkness was coming back again. A clink announced the presence of metal with a sharp edge. You hear that? The loony said. It's my knife. I'll slice the flesh off you bit by bit. <laughs> I wanted to beg for my life to convince the crazy loony that I could buy him as much food as he wanted if he just left me the hell alone. But I couldn't even muster the words. Not with the darkness weighing down heavily on me, dragging me under. Please, don't kill me. When I opened my eyes, and what seemed like ages later, it was only to see a place that looked like heaven. Everything was white. The walls, the bedsheets, the tables, my bandages. Even my girlfriend Sophia was dressed in a white gown. She stood across the room looking out a window. Soph? My voice was a barely audible croak. Fortunately, it was sufficient to draw her attention. She turned and ran over to where I lay and sat on the edge of the bed. The depression in the bed brought me discomfort and I groaned. She jumped off of it immediately. Well, I'm sorry, I forgot. It was then that I realized that this wasn't heaven. There couldn't be any pain in heaven. What happened? I asked Sophia. The guy... He was arrested she said, and her eyes clouded up. They said he's a psychopath, a hobo. He used to be a soldier, but then he lost it. I sighed, wondering how close I had been to death. He killed another guy that night, Sophia continued. Left one other guy half dead. It took half the neighborhood to put him down. 
Now the tears were running down her cheeks. Every single one of them was left with a wound. Now I knew how close I had been to death. I shuddered, completely horrified. But still, I thanked my stars for saving me. It was like a second life to me. There was so much blood. The crimson liquid seemed to drip down my very screen, drenching it in the blood of the mangled woman it spurted from on the other side. She was in so much pain, yet we all sat there, watching with gaping eyes. Thirty minutes earlier. Okay, John, it's your turn. Truth or dare. Millie's words were sharp and felt rushed. She was clearly bored, and I couldn't just go with truth again like the last six people. Dare. A general consensus of shock emerged from the collective around me, gasping at my choice. Okay, John, I dare you to search something up. Everyone sighed at the mundane dare, but then she continued, Oh no, John, not on Google. I want you to search something up on the dark web. The group fell silent. We all had heard stories about that fabled place, such a desolate, morbid, and deranged environment for the mentally ill, devoid of all humanity and moral direction. It was the amplification of hell, and the internet had every way of accessing it. Even for a group of 18-year-olds, bored and verging on drunk, we were about to experience the pure embodiment of evil brought to reality. We just didn't know it yet. Millie, how am I supposed to get on the dark web? I have no clue how to access it. I spoke firmly, preparing several more excuses as I was reluctant to dare go near that foul region of the internet. It was a dangerous place. Here, take this. Millie then proceeded to take out an open laptop from under a pillow, which, as she passed it to me, and as my hands rubbed against the cold surface of the metallic exterior, I saw the search bar at the top of my screen with a selection of videos underneath, which I could see had decapitated corpses just on the thumbnail alone. Millie, why do you have this open? I asked with a trickle of discomfort running down my throat. I thought it'd be funny to watch someone do a dare with it, but never mind that, John. Do your dare now. And with that, everyone's confused expressions turned to me. I looked around the room at each one of their faces, Every single one was plagued with a guilty desire to see me do the dare, knowing full well of the dangers it presented. Every excuse I had prepared had dissipated at this point. I was basing my reasoning purely off the fact we had no access to it, but here, awaiting me in my arms, was a laptop bearing devil spawn blasting into my eyes. I swallowed and decided I couldn't lose, and so I began typing. Just a couple moments passed before I looked up and then back down at what I was about to search for. Everyone looked eager to watch my reaction to the horrors that were lying in front of me. And I? I was about to witness them, eternally scarring my feeble innocence. I hid in her. In nanoseconds, thousands upon thousands of videos came flowing onto my screen. The colors were made up of reds and beiges and darker tones, foreboding what was to come in terms of content and for what I was about to experience. I clicked on the first one. It was a live stream. Hopefully it would end quickly and nothing atrocious would happen. A truly pathetic hope. Immediately I was made aware of a woman on my screen. She was sat on a wooden chair in the center of a dark room. Ropes tied all around her body. A filthy looking mask wrapped around her head. Two men stood beside her. One stared blankly at the screen. I take it was to read chats whilst the other fiddled with a pair of scissors in his hand. Before long, I started seeing messages pop up on the chat section of the stream. They included extremities like, slash her throat, gut that bitch, rip out her lungs and feed them back to her. And then they continued in their revolting words until eventually, one message popped up followed by a thousand pound donation. Its words read, I want that fat fuck holding the scissors to cut open her skin whilst that retard besides him digs his nails into her eyes. Get on with it. The two men immediately got into position, whilst trying to hold the woman down, who had clearly heard the text, and was now struggling to break free from her bonds. 
shaking her body from side to side with little success. It was futile for her. She ran out of energy quite quickly, and as her shaking relaxed, the brute on her left took the pair of scissors and started cutting from her upper wrist, treating the skin as soft rubber as he made his way down in the arm as her flesh peeled open, revealing a fleshy inside. Blood suddenly started pouring from her. Her movement became erratic as she flung her body again from side to side, reacting to not just her skin being literally cut open, but now to her eyes being crushed from the other man, who had grabbed her head and was firmly gouging its thumbs directly into what could only be her eyes. Soon enough, you could see the blood staining the mask she was wearing. As the scissors reached her upper back, and now traveling down her left arm, revealing several veins that were now gushing liters of blood out of her body as she dropped into unconsciousness. The torture continued. Everyone gathered round by this point, all our mouths sat gaping open at the obscene horrors present in front of us. Some even left to throw up in the toilets outside from the shock. Me and Millie were simply staring at one another. My eyes were bloodshot and on the verge of tears whilst hers, hers looked full of energy, excited, thrilled, pleasured. Since that day, since I closed that laptop, since I left her house, I have never felt the same. Every day I witness in dreams and hallucinations of my skin being cut apart, separating it from my flesh as my eyes are plucked out by a large ogre of a man. All wilt some psychotic man sits at home, watching in awe at what his money has got him. The sadism that haunts our world confounds me. My parents never found out. I couldn't tell them. They would call the police and I would cause a huge fuss knowing that there was nothing anybody could do to stop these videos from being uploaded, filmed, or created. The thought of what I had seen that day not only haunted me, but the fact it was futile to try and stop it, that is the thing that tortures me eternally. We will never be safe. Evil lurks everywhere. It just takes one evening of stupidity to see it. Oh, that yellow app. Everyone, at least those I knew, loved Snapchat. Everyone around me used it. At first, I was not a fan of it, but with time, I found myself deeper in love with it. I had just gotten home from a walk that day when my mom called to tell me that she was going to be back home late. They had something to do at work. It's okay. Just don't be too late, I told her. I had refused to go to college. I was taking my own time after high school. I needed to find a job, help my mom or anything of that sort. I relaxed on my bed after the call to chat with a few people. It was only random talks and viewing their stories on Snapchat. I replied to some of the stories, but there was a particular one that caught my attention. I viewed a story where a girl, the owner of the account, looked dead with blood all over her body. I had not paid attention to it and ignored it. Something clicked in my head, and I went back to check it. The story was no longer there. I could not remember the person that posted it. I just randomly viewed it, and now, someone could be in trouble that I couldn't help with. I tried to go over the stories again, in case I was missing something, but there was nothing. Nothing at all. I tried to relax my mind through the questions that kept coming. What if the girl was dead, and whoever killed her mistakenly posted it on Snapchat, while trying to delete something on her phone? The killer, or whoever, might have realized it quickly and deleted it. Though... There was also the question of it being a joke. Could someone joke about something like that? It was better to find out. I sat up on my bed and retraced everything I had done after my mom called me. All the names, stories, bits of information that I was missing that could help. Eventually, I was able to recall the names of those I had viewed the stories of. As the names popped in my head, I went back to check if their story was still there. If it wasn't, I chatted them up with a particular question that I knew only they could answer. That way, I could be sure they were the ones actually replying to my message. Laura. I remembered the girl. I checked her story and it was no longer there. It was just a few minutes ago that she deleted the story, or whoever deleted it. 
I chatted her up and waited for a while, but she didn't respond. My mind had begun to think of different scenarios of what could possibly be going on with her. Many things could be wrong, and no one would know because she was probably alone. She was my mate in high school, someone like me who had refused to go to college too. I kept sending messages which she kept ignoring, no reply. I called her repeatedly, but she didn't respond. I was going to have to check on her at her house to make sure she was fine. Luckily, her house was not too far from mine. It was only about a five-minute walk, though I got there faster since I basically ran from my house. The front door of her place was open, and no one was home. I knew her parents would be working, but she had a brother that was supposed to be back from school. He was still in high school, but the house was empty and quiet. I checked again on Snapchat and noticed she had just posted one of her old pictures on her story. She was never the type to do throwbacks. Something was definitely wrong. I called the police immediately. I was not sure of my theory, but it was enough to get me scared. I was never the kind to think the worst of things, but I already thought the worst of things possible with Laura, and I just had to make sure she was fine. The police came around in a short time, and I explained everything to them, which they took note of. You said she posted on her Snapchat if you thought she was not fine. I don't think there's the need to go over these things unnecessarily. She is fine. Why'd you call the police? An officer asked. I know, but like I said, she's not the type to post throwbacks and not with a love emoji. That's not Laura. Something's wrong. Whoever has Laura and her phone did it so no one would notice that something is wrong, I told them. The officers looked at me strangely, whispered something to themselves, and looked back at me like they were trying to understand something about me. I waited patiently and earnestly. They were not supposed to take that long except when they found something. I paced around the front of Laura's house with hope that she was going to be around or something would be found. I turned around and saw the officers bringing out a body covered in blood. The person was not breathing or moving or trying to get up. It can't be Laura, I thought. The tears had started to drop with the worst thoughts in my mind. We found her like this the officers said. Thank you for contacting us as soon as you noticed this. We didn't find her phone in there, which means that whoever did this has her phone and is using it so no one would know something is wrong. How are they going to get the killer? Laura could not just be dead like that. I wanted to ask the officers how they were going to find the killer, but words wouldn't come out of my mouth, only tears from my eyes. Laura was gentle, and I couldn't help but wonder who would even think of killing such a good-hearted person. The police packed her body and moved her out of the house after contacting her parents and those that they needed to contact. They claimed they were going to take her to the hospital to get an autopsy. I walked back home with many questions still on my mind. My mom had been calling me because she was home already and I was nowhere to be found. I sent her a message saying I was fine so she would not be worried. Walking back home was the only way I could get my mind off with music playing loudly in my ears. I was going to wait patiently for the report to come back, and whenever they found the killer, I only hoped it was soon. I could not imagine how her parents were feeling at the moment. Days turned to weeks as I waited for any update on Laura's killer. Sadly, the only update I got was of her family moving to another town. The pain of living in the same house where their daughter was murdered was too much for them to bear. As for me, I suffer from constant anxiety I was the one who messaged her after the incident. I don't think I would ever feel safe again. My Aunt Molly lived in one of the most expensive apartments in town. It was large with four floors and two apartments on every floor. My aunt didn't live in the penthouse, but the apartment she lived in on the third floor was enough compensation. One summer, when my parents were traveling to see my grandparents, they agreed to let my younger sister, Vivian, and I spend the weekend with her. We were used to staying home whenever they had to go on trips like that, but it seemed like everyone was willing to leave the house empty for a while. Friday morning, my parents traveled. I dropped my sister off at school and went to mine. In the afternoon when school was over, I branched to my sister's school and picked her up. That wasn't a new routine. 
I've been my sister's chauffeur ever since I got my car when I was 16 and she was 10. The new trail to my routine was the journey we made to my aunt's house. She had registered with the securities beforehand. Those were one of the things that excited myself and Vivian. The house's tight security, the celebrity-like treatment. It was even better than an A-list actor occupying the penthouse. We were allowed into the house with no hassle. Aunt Molly dropped by my school earlier that day to give me the access card to her apartment. She worked in the entertainment industry, and she was never back home until late in the evening, sometimes at nighttime. But she promised to be back home early that day. She only knew it wouldn't be soon enough to welcome us from school. Vivian and I didn't mind. We relaxed and were comfortable in no time after we checked into the house and ate lunch. An hour later, we received a call from Aunt Molly. Are you at home now? She asked. Yes, I replied. I told her about how comfortable her house was. I thanked her for her snacks and juice she left for us and also asked when she would be coming home or if she was done with work. She confirmed that she was done and on her way to the mall to get some supplies and some groceries that we would certainly need. A quick remembrance of the things in her refrigerator made me wonder what other things we needed, but I didn't ask. I was about to tell her to hurry back when an emergency light flickered and an emergency alarm didn't stop ringing in the room. Aunt Molly must have heard the sound too because she asked what was wrong, and before I could answer, a loud and clear announcement was made from the security office. An intruder is lurking somewhere in the apartment. You are now under lockdown. My heart dropped and adrenaline rushed through me. I could see it through my skin. The call with Aunt Molly ended abruptly. My sister stared at me, her eyes heavy with fear and trepidation. I didn't know what to say or do. I was as scared as she was. She rushed towards the door. Lock all the windows and every other door. I barked at her, and the two of us scrambled through the apartment, locking every door and window, checking, then double-checking. Another ten minutes later, my phone vibrated, and I realized that it was a call from Aunt Molly. She asked to speak with Vivian first. I handed over the phone to Vivian and watched as fear dissipated from her eyes. Whatever Aunt Molly was telling her, it was working. It isn't long before she gave the phone back to me. Joan, I need you to be brave. It's the first thing Aunt Molly says when she was sure the phone was in my possession. She went on to narrate how the cops were on the trail of a serial r Luck collided with them that afternoon, and they caught on with the r But just before they could apprehend him, he ran into the apartment and they had to lock down the entire apartment to catch him. It was a scary thing to hear. She told me to lock the doors and stay safe in the house. The cops would swing by soon and check, but we shouldn't be scared. I nodded, forgetting that she couldn't see me. The call ended while after she told me to make a call if I noticed anything wrong. I held my sister's hand and was leading her into one of the rooms when I heard the sound of ruffling feet. I didn't allow myself to believe that one thought that traveled into my mind. It couldn't be the serial had found his way into my aunt's apartment. I stopped in my tracks and gripped my sister's hand with more energy. She would have winced if I didn't cover her mouth so quickly and listen to the silence. The man must have caught on to our presence because the atmosphere remained still. I bent over to look at my sister. The fear that was gone a while was back and worse. I trembled and my breathing became heavier. I thought hard about what to do in seconds. The door to a room creaked and I knew the man was checking to see who had discovered his presence. My thumping heart was racing. My hand shook and I could barely make a call. Vivian, or so I thought, yanked it off as I tried to steady it in my hands. I looked up to see the coldest eyes I had ever seen in my life. In his hands was my little sister crying. He gripped me too and covered my mouth before I could even scream. He dragged us towards one of the rooms 
and I was sure that was the end of us. His breath smelt like weed and alcohol. His hands were rough, and I couldn't help but think of what would happen next. After a while, he tied me to one side of the bed and covered my eyes with a blindfold. I didn't know what he had done to my sister, but I heard her wince and cry. Hot tears filled my eyes at the sound of the agony in her voice. I prayed hard that someone would discover us or figure out that the criminal wasn't in the other places because he was here, in my Aunt Molly's apartment. They did discover us, but by that time, half of my clothes were gone. But I was safe. Luckily, the creep couldn't harm my sister as well. The criminal was arrested. Mom never let me visit Aunt Molly in the apartment ever again. They came back from their trip that day and took us back home. My sister still suffers from the trauma, but I believe in time, she'll be okay. I mean, something worse could have happened, and I just hope to never be trapped in another lockdown again. My name is Emily Castings. I'm in my early 20s with few friends and an addicted OnlyFans user. It wasn't just for the money, it was for the pleasure and satisfaction it brought me. But something unexpected happened and I didn't continue it for long before I stopped. It started in the second summer after I registered on OnlyFans and got my account rolling with quality artistic content. I got popular fast on the app because I was raw honest and intentional with my content. I understood what people meant by how elating it was to make money from what they love doing. I didn't expect anyone to recognize me. I didn't shoot my face. There was no access to my real name or address. It didn't make sense that someone would recognize me. Well, things didn't go as planned and someone eventually was able to track my original identity. Sadly, that someone was very dangerous. I lived alone in a city far away from where my parents were based. I returned home one night after my shift at a summer job. The aura I felt as I got home was chilly. My house was quiet, more quiet than usual, but I ignored it and blamed it on the unusual blackout in my neighborhood. I entered the house, turned on a flashlight, and checked around to see if anything was amiss. Nothing was. I went into my room and shook off every strange feeling. I got undressed, took a shower, and tucked myself into bed. Now, originally I planned to record a video for my account that night, but with the blackout it wasn't feasible, so I slept. I woke up around 3am. A strange sound filled my ears, jolting me from La La Land to reality. I couldn't be sure if it was a machine or something, but it was from outside my window. The blackout wasn't fixed yet, and fear gripped me in the darkness. I searched for my phone, but it was to no avail. I couldn't find it anywhere near me. The sound continued for a long time, but I couldn't tell how long. I didn't have access to a flashlight or even my phone. I only clung to my blanket and pillows until the sound stopped and I fell asleep again. When I woke up the next morning, the phone was by my head and underneath it was a note. You look pretty innocent sleeping like a baby than when you play with yourself behind the camera. The note read, A lipstick kiss stained the paper at the end of the message, and I flung both my phone and the paper away. It was broad daylight, and I couldn't stand up from the bed. I recognized the lipstick as the shade I used for my videos on OnlyFans. I didn't know what to do, who to report to, or what to even report. I was confused in bed, and after a while I screamed. I grew silent. And crept out of the bed, looking around stealthily. The note and my phone being so close to my head that morning could mean only one thing. Someone had come into my house the night before. If the note was any evidence, he watched me sleep, too. Perhaps the person was there when I woke up in the middle of the night. Maybe the person was with my phone while I looked around in fear because of the sound I heard. What if the person was making the sound? I had just one resolution, to get out of the house as quickly as I could. I ran towards my closet, shaking with every movement in search of something to wear, but the door wouldn't budge. It was hooked in place. 
by shaky hands stilled. The door was never locked. I didn't have a key for it. I took quiet steps backward and silently rushed toward my phone. There was only one explanation for the locked door. My intruder was still in the house. I shook from head to toe as I turned on my phone and dialed the emergency number. When it didn't respond, I started to cry. Thinking it was best for me to exit the room, I opened the door leading outside, but it remained in place too. My phone still wasn't responding. I tried the door that led to the toilet. It was locked too. My sobs became louder. I rushed towards my window. It couldn't be lifted, but I shouted for help anyway. That must have triggered my intruder. One door clicked open, and because I was not facing any, I couldn't tell which. I froze for some milliseconds, but resumed my scream at no one in particular. I knew no one could hear my scream, not from the locked window and the deserted street. Although my eyes caught sight of a black car parked close to my window, it was probably my intruder's car. He was closer to me now, his breathing heavy and his steps intimidating. He bent down and moved his face close to my ear. The chilly aura I felt since the previous night intensified, my teeth clattered. His mouth smelled like alcohol as he muttered only for me to hear. Your screaming's too loud. You should bring it low. No one will hear you anyway, miss. He ended the sentence with my OnlyFans username, and I confirmed how he knew me. Or not. No one was supposed to recognize me. I decided to be brave. I didn't have any other choice either way. How do you know me? I said as I looked at him, or at least tried to. He was tall and well built. His muscles were chiseled underneath the rumpled shirt and jeans he had on. Now if I met him in other circumstances, I was bound to fall for his beauty. Oh, it's easy to recognize your victims, he chuckled. Especially when they let you see all the sensitive parts of their body. His fingers traced my curves. I flinched. Adrenaline surged through me at the mention of the word victims. He smiled, and I found his white set of teeth irritating rather than intriguing. You don't have to run, he winked. We're going outside anyway. Follow me. He grabbed my arms and dragged me along with him after watching me wear a short gown. I couldn't struggle even if I wanted to. I cooperated, and we were by his car in a few minutes looking like every average couple. His car smelled metallic, like blood. The seat of the car was wet and irritating. I didn't know what would happen to me. But then I saw a police patrol car. Before he could react, I kicked him in the nuts, <clears throat> opened the car door, and rolled out. Although injured, I ran fast towards the police car. They must have noticed the awkwardness in the situation because they sped towards our direction. It was too late for my intruder to run. He was cornered and caught. The bizarre situation was when three human heads were found in his trunk. If I wasn't so lucky, I could have been the fourth. He was jailed. I thanked my stars and changed my ways. Now I give myself pleasure. Only for my pleasure. Alcoholism. That was what started it all. Every Saturday I would roam the streets of town, pouring bottles and bottles down my throat until my liver felt satisfied with pain. I would get a cab back each time, the poor drivers having to deal with my incessant voice, an unbearable harpy-like noise that I look back on with a haze. Whilst the drivers, well, they certainly remembered. One night in particular, I happened to have gone out again, drinking, downing wine this time at a local restaurant, bar, with a couple of work colleagues. The succulent aroma of the warm drink felt comfortable on my stomach as I lay down on a nearby sidewalk about to call a cab to come and collect me from my pitiless state. One after another, every single one I called either turned me down or was busy. I strained my tampered mind and remembered that a new car rental was in the market. My friend Hannah had told me a couple nights before the weekly drinking session. I downloaded the app, loaded it up, 
clicked a few buttons and signed a few documents until eventually my screen lit up and I was able to bear witness to a man named Tom who was on his way to me now, ready to pick me up and drive me to the safety of my apartment. It told me on the app that he was new and so had no reviews or ratings or any record of him ever driving with the site before. I was marginally anxious to get in a car with an unknown driver, but I really didn't have a choice if I didn't want to sleep on the concrete sidewalk below me. A matte black Volvo pulled up on the curb about ten minutes into the wait after I had placed my order for a lift. I sat up, my head spinning in a vortex of dizzy whirls and gusts of ear-splitting headaches as I crawled over to the side door and clambered inside. Is this my Uber? My Uber? I spluttered out in chunks of words that formed distorted sentences, but the information was enough to communicate to the driver that I thought I was getting in. The driver said nothing. He almost looked surprised as I got in and strapped up. It was odd, but nothing completely out of the ordinary, as I was on a different plane of drunkenness that the man almost seemed delighted by. This incredibly shocked me. Usually, no late-night taxi driver would ever take pleasure in a drunk person entering their car. Once I had closed the door and told him my address, the car started rolling forward and we were on our way to what should have been my apartment. We drove in silence for quite some time. I remember vividly seeing the outlines of trees flashing me on both sides. I didn't live very near the countryside, so going down a country lane seemed strange. But I really couldn't care, as the alcohol was deep in my system by this point, and I was far more focused on rejecting the urge to vomit everywhere than I was the route this guy was taking me home to. Hi, um, are we nearby? I'm sorry, I'm just really, really tired, and it would be great to get home at some point tonight. I sounded snarky in my speech, but sleep deprivation does that, and mixed with my deteriorating alcohol consumption, I was nearing the end of my patience, as I knew for sure it would not take me 30 minutes to get from town to the apartment. I lived five minutes away. Mm. He seemed to grumble at my question of when we were arriving home, and so I began thinking maybe I should try tipping him or something for him to take me the right way got out my phone to use Apple Pay. But then, all of a sudden, I noticed several missed calls, with the app notification above each one. I unlocked my phone, and my eyes were engulfed with a waking terror. The notifications came from the cab driver who actually had come to pick me up, asking me where I was, and that he was in a blue BMW a couple minutes walk down the road from the restaurant I'd been at. I slowly looked up, and my eyes met with the crazed look of this blue-eyed man, covered in wrinkles, and a horrific grin spread from cheek to cheek across his face. He glared at me, and finally spoke. You dare call anyone, and I'll kill us both, you whore. This violent outburst made me whimper as I sat back in my seat and tried banging on the door to get it to open, or rather to attract the attention of someone outside. It was a feeble attempt for salvation. We were deep down some random country lane. There were likely to be zero cars for miles, and that was even if he was taking me anywhere with actual people. My breathing picked up as my lungs contracted out of fear for my life as we seemed to speed up down the lane. You, you're mine. Let's go have some fun, shall we? His hand beckoned to the knife it held in front of me. He dangled it directly in front of me, cackling at what evil thoughts he must have had planned. But soon enough, a faint tinge of blue beamed out across the road, and from behind it, a police car emerged from the darkness. The moment I saw the car, its sirens started blasting out all across the woods, and we swiftly pulled over as the man scrambled to hide the knife under his seat as two officers darted towards us, both wielding tasers. They got him out of the car in a matter of seconds, cuffing him shortly after, jamming him in the back of the patrol car as they then turned their attention to me. Hi there, miss. Are you okay? 
the indescribable feeling of salvation struck me like a bag of bricks, crushing my fears and unleashing the waterfall of tears behind my eyes like a pair of dams being blown wide open. I told them everything that happened that night. The stranger, the alcohol, the fear. And soon enough, my attention turned to the knife hiding under the seat. I pointed to it. They then told me the backstory as to how they knew where to find me before setting me up with an actual lift home. This cab hailing app supposedly had tracking capabilities which allowed the driver to seek their passenger. Tom, my actual driver, had noticed I was heading in the completely wrong direction to the destination I had input. He quickly alerted the police, and they pursued after us hotly. As for the man, he had decided that he was going to try to take a drunken girl somewhere deep into the forest. But his plans were never told to me past that. All I knew was that if it wasn't for Tom, I could have been killed. Since then, I've tried to remain sober on such occasions in order to keep my guard up, but that man's putrid smile still haunts me. I sometimes see it in the mirror of my own car, watching me with dark purpose, waiting. The alarm jilted me from sleep. I arose from the bed in a hurry and checked the time. Another alarm beeped almost immediately. The tone of the alarm was enough to let me know what day it was. I hate Halloween. I hate the memory that comes with it. I hate that my neighbors always report the flickering lights and sparks that happen in their house every Halloween. Maybe because it once happened to me, too. People say Halloween is a time when bad or evil spirits are ushered out of the world into their realms. But it seemed evil decided to visit me the last time things were good. It was a tricky visit on Halloween two years ago. It started with rain. Rain wasn't exactly regular, but the forecast predicted showers, so it didn't come as a surprise. I didn't always hate Halloween. I was a very big fan of the parties, trick-or-treat games, pumpkin decorations, and the masks that came with them. When my parents permitted me to be a part of the school's organized Halloween mast party, of course I was elated. That evening, just before it was time for the party, I decided to catch my favorite show. And that's when the rain started. And my dad was in the bathroom getting ready for an outing he had with my mom. I had no idea where they were going, and I didn't think it was my business either. My mom was loading the washing machine, or well, doing some housework that was of no concern to me. I was glued to the television, too focused to realize that the rain had gone from light showers to a heavy thunderstorm. I didn't notice until the light in the sitting room flickered. It was weird. My body shuddered with the continuous flickering of the light. The frequency rhymed with the thunder. The ground trembled. My heart sank at the possibility that the rain would disturb my party and outing. It didn't make sense that heavy rain was falling. The light flickers intensified. The television also flashed on and off. I hugged myself tightly in my seat, resisting the urge to call my parents. I was 16, too old for that. Just like every other person would be, I was scared. Outside, the house trembled and every corner of the house shook. The chairs vibrated in their space, and I wondered why the weather was putting in so much effort. I wanted the rain to stop, but it got louder and harsher. At some point, a rumble of thunder caused the television to go off, and the entire house was thrown into darkness, too. In a few seconds, the light came back on, almost like it never left. But it was accompanied by loud shrieks. Trembling, I stood up from the chair. Mom? Dad? I called, but got no responses. My mind swayed to the shriek and scream I heard. The one sounded like the voice of a woman. I strangely thought it belonged to my mother. She had a unique voice, tiny and high-pitched. People loved to say that I looked so much like her, especially because of her blonde hair and voice, but I didn't want it to be my mother's voice. That would only mean one thing. Something was wrong. The other voice sounded masculine, and I could swear that it was from the bathroom. 
I couldn't help but wonder if my mom and dad made the noise at the same time because of the blackout, but I realized it couldn't be. The noise didn't come from the blackout, it came after, and I didn't want it to be them. I traced my footsteps across the ground and found myself headed to the bathroom, the one my father used. I dragged each step, and the fear that was settled in my heart intensified. The rain still fell, and the thunder still shook the house at intervals. I didn't make it there first, because at the corner of the kitchen, my mom lay at the base of the open freezer. She resembled bones covered with a thin layer of flesh. A scream erupted from my lungs, and I ran back to the sitting room. It couldn't be my mother. I took even slower steps back into the kitchen, still in denial. The closer I went, the clearer it became that the one in the kitchen was indeed my mother. I stopped myself from screaming and ran from my lifeless mother to the destination I had in mind in the first place. The bathroom was quiet and still. I started to cry. What was going on? My head could barely wrap around the fact that my mother was only bones and flesh. My fisted palms banged hard on the door of the toilet. Blood rushed in my brain as I anticipated the response of my father. Dad! I shouted many times. When I didn't get a response after what seemed like a long time, I tried to twist the doorknob, and it bent in my hands. I opened the door. My dad didn't always lock the door whenever he went to the toilet or bathroom. My mom had complained many times, but he never listened. My legs shook as I entered the bathroom. Dad? I called again, but stopped. It was a pool of blood. My dad was on the floor in a pool of red liquid, his shaving blade in his hands close to his neck. I saw a cut by his chin down to his neck. He was starting to resemble my mother. For the second time that evening, I screamed. My heart was no longer inside me. My brain was dispersed in many directions, trying to find meaning to the tragedy in my house. I found a phone and dialed the emergency number. I willed myself to stay sane. I went back to where my mother lay, unrecognizable. I would have shaken her back to life, but my legs were hooked to the ground, studying her bizarre physique. It couldn't have been a serial killer or an assassin. What could it be? I thought hard and remembered it was Halloween. Was the house haunted by vengeful ghosts? Or did the evil spirits stop by while the rain was heavy? The detectives that appeared some time later found the answer. Electrical problems. My mom was shocked to death by the electricity when she tried to retrieve something from the freezer that was connected to the power supply. My dad's shaving blade was electrical. He was in the bathroom with water and a power supply colliding. Wasn't a good ending. That's one of the reasons I hate Halloween. I lost all of my family. The other reason is that no heavy rains have fallen since then. It wasn't supposed to fall that day either. It was physics fun when I tampered with the electricity wiring a day before to add special effects to Halloween. The police didn't know that. They didn't need to know that I still tampered with the wiring of the neighbors every Halloween too. Lucky them that there wasn't a heavy rainstorm. <laughs>